Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. It is our traditional uh, scripture reading to open the season of Lent, the story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, where he goes head to head with the devil, jousting with scripture references. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the devil took him to the holy city and placed him up on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. But Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only God. At this, the devil left him. And suddenly angels came and waited on him. May these words be to us, our light and our life. Thanks be to God. Well, having a good car ride often depends upon who is driving. (laughs) According to one study, more than half of all passengers are scared of the people driving them. (laughs) And most point to their spouse as the scariest. (laughs) It's scary to ride with someone who waits until the very last minute to slow down or who follows just a little too close, or treats the lines as mere suggestions. (laughs) We get frustrated with people who won't stop and ask for directions. We put our lives in the hands of drivers who are distracted by food and cell phones and reaching for something in the back seat. Now, I used to think that I was a good driver. But my family has caught me doing all of the above things. And even before my kids could talk, they sometimes felt it necessary to bring up the fact that I took curves a little too fast. Do you catch my drift there? I think most of us who drive prefer to be in the driver's seat. Perhaps the same could be said of our lives. We would like to think that all the controls we need are within reach, our vision is clear, and we know just where we are going. And yet sometimes, as we go around life's curves and over its bumps, we get a kind of queasy feeling and suspect someone or something else has taken the wheel. Is it time to pull over and let someone else drive? Our scripture story this morning begins by saying Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now I like that in the Gospel of Mark's version of this story it says 
The Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness. <laughs> However he got there, it's clear that Jesus did not go there of his own motivation. He was led there. And it was this verse that caught our attention as we were looking for a theme for Lent. Lent started this past Wednesday with Ash Wednesday and is a season of reorientation. And we felt called by this first verse to explore over the next few weeks what it means to be spirit-led and to pay attention to what happens when we let other things take the wheel of our lives. So to begin understanding what it means in this story to be led by the Spirit, we first must remind ourselves who is this Spirit being talked about? Who is the Spirit that leads Jesus into the wilderness? We are meant to know that it is the same Spirit of God that was present with Jesus at his baptism just the chapter before. It's the same Holy Spirit from which he was conceived. It's the same spirit of truth that Jesus promises will remain with us and guide us long after he's gone. It is the same spirit that called the first Christians to become the church. And it is that spirit that is what we experience when we suddenly feel part of something larger. When light fills us. When something ordinary, like a stone, becomes sacred. It is when, in a moment, we are convinced heaven and earth meet. So the question is, why would the Spirit of God lead Jesus in the wilderness to be tempted? In the chapter just before this story, Jesus is baptized in the River Jordan. And you might remember from the story that when Jesus comes up out of the river, his true identity is revealed. This is my beloved son, a heavenly voice is heard to say. It's no surprise according to author and pastor Nadia Boltz Weber, that as soon as his identity is revealed, something arises to challenge him. In her book, Pastrix, The Cranky, Beautiful Faith of a Sinner and Saint, she writes, quote, demons are defined as anything other than God that tries to tell us who we are. Let me say that again. Demons are defined as anything other than God that tries to tell us who we are. She goes on, and maybe just moments after Jesus' baptism, when the devil says to him, if you are the Son of God, he does so because he knows that Jesus is vulnerable to temptation precisely to the degree he is insecure about this new identity and perhaps still mistrusts his relationship with God. She concludes, if God's first move is to give us our identity, then the devil's first move is to throw that identity into question." End quote. We all have moments, perhaps more than moments, of insecurity. When we lose sight completely lose sight of our own belovedness. The voices surrounding us make it hard to hold on to who we really are, whose we really are. Henry Nouwen puts it better than I can. He writes, the world says, yeah, I love you if you are good looking, intelligent, and wealthy. I love you if you have a good education, a good job, and good connections. I love you if you produce much, sell much, and buy much. 
There are endless ifs hidden in the world's love, he continues. These ifs enslave me since it is impossible to respond adequately to all of them. The world's love is and always will be conditional. And as long as I keep looking for my true self in the world of conditional love, I will remain hooked to the world, trying, failing, and trying again. He concludes, it is a world that cannot satisfy the deepest craving of my heart. The sign post for conditional love is this word, if. And we see it here in The Devil's Temptations, too. If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from the top of the temple. If you will fall down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Jesus rejects these invitations because he recognized the difference between the devil's conditional adoration and God's unconditional love. He refused to play the devil's game, knowing the list of conditions would never end. The only reward that conditional love delivers is destruction. Now perhaps we all know a voice of conditional love in our lives. If you are a good friend, you will. If you are a good husband or wife, you will. If you are really committed to justice, you should. If you are a good student, you will. Whether or not you believe the devil is behind the voice of conditional love in your life, I personally don't believe there is a devil behind it. We all do our fair share of piling conditions on ourselves and each other. We do so much damage, so much damage, rehearsing these statements over and over. And most of the time, we don't even notice that we're doing it. There are tapes running. But hear this. Any, any expectation that we have that people, our friends, spouses, parents, neighbors, co-workers, bosses, doctors, political leaders, spiritual leaders, or anything these people do, our expectation that somehow they will satisfy our deepest cravings, the deepest cravings of our hearts, will ultimately be disappointed. But this realization should not make us withdraw from one another or from the world. In fact, Jesus left the wilderness and continued to confront the structures, the relationships of conditional love in all its many forms throughout the rest of his ministry, throughout the rest of his life, indeed through his death and resurrection. He demonstrated how to live life led by the spirit of unconditional love and worked to build a world that reflected that love more and more. Most of us think life is better when we are in the driver's seat. But often though, we are not the ones actually behind the wheel. Without meaning to, we have put our lives in the hands of an erratic driver, hell-bent on our destruction. This Lent, we are invited to pull over and change drivers, to be led instead by the Spirit. 
We are invited to put God's unconditional love in the driver's seat of our lives. Amen.